It's no surprise that one out of every three living humans is either overweight or obese. Obesity is becoming a global pandemic. The prevalence has more than doubled in four decades. Obesity affects more than one billion humans. Obesity is not just a condition, it's a clear disease as declared by the World Health Organization in 1997 and by the European Commission in 2021. Obesity cuts five to 10 years of life and as the body mass index crosses 25, there is a sharp increase in mortality, as shown in a study of more than 10 million individuals. And it's not only the medical aspect, there is a huge cost imparted by obesity and overweight. The direct and the indirect costs are expected to surpass $4 trillion by 2035. Obesity is a cause for type 2 diabetes, gallbladder disease, fatty liver disease, gout. It's a risk factor for breast cancer, endometrial cancer. However, more than two-thirds of the deaths related to obesity are due to cardiovascular diseases. Obesity is a strong risk factor for diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and sleep apnea. Obesity increases the risk of atherosclerotic disease, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, sudden cardiac death, pulmonary embolism, venous thromboembolism, and aortic valve stenosis. So in this episode, we will focus on the treatments of obesity and how they impact the cardiovascular system. And we are guided here by the latest clinical consensus statement from the European Society of Cardiology published in August of this year. Welcome to Cardio Buzz, your one-stop shop for all things cardiology. We bring you the news, groundbreaking research, and the most recent guidelines. We interview the experts in the field and try to answer the most difficult questions of everyday practice. First, we need to debunk a common myth that obesity is simply caused by our love of food or the lack of willpower. Obesity, in fact, is much more complicated than that. It's the result of complex interactions between the genes and the environment. Obese parents are more likely to have obese children, and there are multiple hormones that can have effects on the body weight, not only the thyroid hormones, but also the hormones of hunger and the hormones of satiety. And these are also closely linked to several psychological factors. We know that binge eating can be a coping mechanism with stress. And we know that depression is also associated with obesity. And we know that poverty is associated with obesity. The modern lifestyle being sedentary, the food industry with more caloric dense food, with more refined sugars and with more trans fatty acids. All of these factors result in increasing energy intake and reduced energy expenditure. So in our fight against obesity, we need to remember that just simply consuming fewer calories for a short period of time is not enough. And this is a lifelong journey. Individuals must adopt lifelong healthy lifestyle behaviors in environments that promote obesity. And this needs attention to diet, to physical activity, to psychological aspects, to the environment, and may also entail taking medications or doing surgeries. So we have three main ways to tackle obesity. Lifestyle interventions, diet, exercise, behavioral and psychological interventions. Then we have medications and we have surgical interventions. And their effects escalating. So lifestyle interventions would give us between 3% and 10%. Medications can give us between 12% and 18%. Surgery can give us between 13% up to 30%. So let's start by the healthy diet. In order to treat obesity, we need to achieve a calorie deficit ranging between 500 to 750 calories per day. Of course, adjustable for the body weight and the activity. And in order to achieve that, there are four key points. Portion control, reducing ultra-processed food, avoiding alcohol, increasing fruit and vegetable intake. But a word of caution here, nutritional recommendations should be individualized. Patients with heart failure, see or cancer, they often experience a catabolic state. So nutritional restrictions should be avoided or applied with great caution for these patients. And we have multiple diets for obesity. We have diets that are plant-based, hypocaloric Mediterranean diet. We have high protein diet. We have diets that restrict energy intake like intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating. We can have low-carb diets. We can have low-fat diets. So what's the difference between these diets? Most of the diets will lead to modest short-term weight loss, but significant cardiovascular risk factor improvement within six months. 
but by 12 months, weight loss and risk factor benefits tend to diminish. And cardiologists prefer Mediterranean diet over other diets for many reasons. Number one, the benefit of Mediterranean diet tends to persist over time. And Mediterranean diet was superior to low-fat diet in reducing major cardiovascular events. And the superiority of Mediterranean diet was more pronounced in men. So let's look at different diets and see what they are best at. So the best diet for weight loss is probably a low carbohydrate, high protein diet. Whereas the best for lowering the systolic blood pressure is the diet that avoids processed food. The best diet to lower diastolic blood pressure is intermittent fasting. The best diet to lower the NDL cholesterol is the vegetarian diet. And the best diet to increase the HDL cholesterol is the low carbohydrate diet. And the best diet to lower the inflammatory C-reactive protein is a low-fat plant-based diet. And then let's move to the next step which is physical activity and exercise. We need to encourage non-sanitary behaviors like if you're in the office try to walk for two minutes each hour use the stairs instead of the elevator try to take extra 1000 or 1800 steps every day and of course the wearable trackers the smart watches the step counters and the heart rate monitors can motivate increasing activity and then physical activity is any body movement that requires energy expenditure it helps to shift fat to muscle mass and alter fat distribution it results in modest weight loss in in short term. Exercise training is any physical activity that is structured, repetitive, and aimed at improving fitness, performance, and health. Exercise training is beneficial in weight loss, reducing the fat mass, maintaining the weight when adopted on the long term, it enhances cardiometabolic health, improves the blood lipid profile, delays the onset of type 2 diabetes, and significantly reduces the blood pressure, of course, benefits mental health. And we have three types of exercise, aerobic exercise, resistance training, and HIIT high intensity interval training. So aerobic exercise is useful in reducing the visceral fat, it improves physical fitness, it has cardiovascular benefits, and it helps glucose control. Resistance training is useful in preserving the muscle mass during weight loss. It improves the muscle strength and it also improves the lipid profile. High intensity interval training is probably the most effective one for reducing the visceral fat, but the problem is that it can be hazardous in patients with heart failure or untreated coronary disease. So it requires cardiovascular risk assessment before starting high intensity interval training. And the recommendations for aerobic exercise are 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate activity or 75 to 150 minutes per week of vigorous physical activity. Whereas resistance training is recommended two to three times a week and there are no clear recommendations on high intensity interval training. Psychosocial interventions are very important because we know that depression is linked to obesity and unhealthy eating habits and obesity worsens depression. So we go into a vicious circle and food is often used to cope with negative emotions, creating again vicious circles of emotional coping and unhealthy eating. Obesity is stigmatized not only in the community, but even among the healthcare professionals, leading to negative attitudes. So in tackling obesity, we need to consider psychosocial interventions involving the family, focusing on improving the diet and the mental well-being. And there are several programs for that. They can extend for one year or two years. They include lifestyle changes, education, peer support, self-monitoring, cognitive restructuring, goal setting, dressing sleep and stress. And these programs can be very effective. They can lead to a 5 to 10% weight loss within 6 months or 1 year. And they are cost effective on the long term. They are available web-based or on mobile phone applications. So if lifestyle interventions alone didn't work, or if the body mass index is 30 or more, or if the body mass index is 27 or more in the presence of one weight-related comorbidity like diabetes, hypertension, or coronary disease, then we need to resort to medications. And we have six FDA-approved medications for obesity, Orlistat, Naltrexone, Bupropion, Liraglutide, Semaglutide, Terzipatide, and Setmelanotide, which is used only for rare monogenic disorders. So let's take them one by one. Orlistat is probably the oldest. It acts by reducing dietary fat absorption in the intestines. It results in modest weight loss, but it significantly lowers the risk of developing diabetes and can reduce hemoglobin A1c independent of weight loss. But unfortunately, we don't have cardiovascular outcome trials for Orlistat. And of course, it causes gastrointestinal side effects. The second medicine is the combination of naltrexone, bupropion, extended release. 
This acts on the satiety center in the hypothalamus and in the limbic reward system to curb the urge to eat and reduce the intense cravings. This medicine is taken twice daily. It needs to be up titrated. It's effective in weight loss, can result in 5.2% weight loss at one year. However, we're not sure about the long-term cardiovascular safety. So it needs to be taken with caution in cardiac patients. It can cause central nervous system side effects and it's contraindicated in patients with uncontrolled hypertension. Then we come to the GLP-1 receptor agonists and glucagon-like peptide-1 receptor agonists. These agents were initially used for diabetes mellitus type 2 and then we started noticing their effects on body weight and then they became approved for adults and children above the age of 12 with obesity. They have multiple effects. They increase the secretion of insulin, they delay gastric emptying, they reduce the intestinal motility and they suppress appetite. Liraglutine is used once daily. It needs to be escalated from 0.6 to 1.2 to 1.8 and the nice thing is that we have a study that showed that liraglutide 1.8 mg per day reduced cardiovascular events by 13% and cardiovascular death by 22% in patients with type 2 diabetes. We can escalate the dose up to 3 mg a day. This results in even more weight loss but we don't have a cardiovascular outcome trial on the large dose. Then probably the most important molecule up to now which is semaglutide. And semaglutide is available in three preparations. The oral preparation is rebelsis, and of course it needs to be escalated, three milligrams, then seven milligrams, then 14 milligrams. Then we have Ozempic, which is only for diabetes. We also need to escalate it from 0.25 to 0.5 to one milligram. Each dose escalation takes one month. And we have Wegovy, which is the same semaglutide, but in doses up to 1.7 mg and 2.4 mg. The oral preparation was found to be non-inferior to placebo in terms of cardiovascular events. It can result in significant reduction of body weight and we might see in the future newer preparations with large doses that can result in 13% weight reduction at 68 weeks. But then probably the most important semaglutide molecule is Wegovy. We know from the STEP program that it can result in 15% weight loss at 68 weeks. And this is associated with favorable changes in systolic blood pressure and LDL. And it's even more potent than liraglutide. Not only that, we have also cardiovascular outcome trials for semaglutide. We have the SUSTAIN-6 investigation that showed that semaglutide in patients with high cardiovascular risk resulted in a reduction of non-fatal myocardial infarction and non-fatal stroke. Even if we look at patients Patients who are obese and without diabetes, semaglutide 2.4 mg in the SELECT trial reduced significantly cardiovascular events and even death from any cause in patients with obesity and without diabetes. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is a special situation because it's closely linked with obesity. The neurohormonal effects of obesity, the inflammatory effects and the hemodynamic effects all culminate in obesity-related heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Weight loss in HFF is useful. It improves the exercise capacity. We've seen that with caloric restriction and with bariatric surgery. And again, we've seen that with semaglutide, the 2.4 milligrams in the STEP HFF trial that showed that semaglutide resulted in 13% body weight loss with significant improvement in functional class. Not only the functional class, but also a significant reduction in C-reactive protein, which tells us that obesity is associated with an inflammatory state, and semaglutide was able to curb that inflammatory state. A fourth indication now for semaglutide, in addition to diabetes, obesity, coronary artery disease, is chronic kidney disease. We have the FLOW trial, and semaglutide in patients with diabetic chronic kidney disease slowed the decline in kidney function. So it's also a nephroprotective agent. So based on that, the guidelines recommend GLP-1 receptor agonists with proven benefit, liraglutide, semaglutide, dulaglutide, in patients with type 2 diabetes and atherosclerotic disease to reduce cardiovascular events. The only GLP-1 receptor agonist that could be recommended in overweight or obese patients with chronic coronary disease is semaglutide to reduce cardiovascular mortality, MI, or stroke. And we also have a strong agent, which is tergipatide, and this has a dual mechanism of action. It's a GLP-1 receptor agonist, and it also stimulates glucose-independent insulinotropic polypeptide. It increases satiety, delays gastric emptying, and results in greater weight loss and greater hemoglobin A1C reductions versus semaglutide 1 milligram. But it has not been tested yet against semaglutide 2.4.
and we don't have cardiovascular outcome trend. This is a mighty agent. The biggest dose, which is 15 milligrams, can result in 20% weight reduction, which is almost equivalent to what we get from bariatric surgery and we're still waiting for the cardiovascular outcome trial. And there are three problems at least with weight loss medications. Number one, the cost. These are expensive medications and in, in low income and middle income countries, you're never gonna be cost effective. And the second issue is the rebound. Most patients would start to regain weight once these medications are stopped. So we might consider continuing on these medications for longer periods of time or even lifelong. We need to combine it with psychosocial interventions, dietary advice, and physical exercise to achieve sustained long-term results. The side effects are many. They all share the common side effect of GIT disturbances for naltrexone, bupropion. There's a problem with chronic opioid use. There is a problem with anti-seizure drugs, concomitant use of bioinhibitors. It's contraindicated in uncontrolled hypertension. Eraglutide, semaglutide, terzipatide, they all have the same side effect profile. In addition to gastrointestinal manifestations, nausea, bloating, dyspepsia, constipation, they also increase the chances of gallstones, of pancreatitis, and the most related side effect is medullary thyroid carcinoma. So these medications are contraindicated in any patient who has a family history of thyroid cancer or pancreatic cancer. And of course, they are all contraindicated in pregnancy. Then we move to the final step, which is bariatric surgery. And we have two types. First, the endoscopic, and then the open surgery. The main endoscopic procedures are intragastric balloon or sleeve gastroplasty. Intragastric balloon is done by endoscopy and the balloon is inserted and then inflated inside the stomach. It reduces the capacity of the stomach, resulting in a weight loss of 9%, but of course, there's weight regain after removal of the balloon. The other procedure is endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, where through the endoscope, stitches are taken in the stomach, resulting in some plication in the fundus of the stomach and reducing the capacity of the stomach. Both procedures are indicated with a body mass index 30 or more, or in obese patients who are considered high risk for invasive bariatric surgery. These are gastric procedures, so they may be contraindicated in patients with prior gastric surgery, GI bleeding, gastric tumors, ulcers, hiatus hernia, and of course pregnancy and psychiatric disorders. And then the major bariatric surgical procedure, which are sleeve gastrectomy and Roman Y. Sleeve gastrectomy results in 50, 25%. Sleeve gastrectomy results in 25% weight loss. Rho and Y gastric bypass 30% weight loss. They are indicated when the body mass index is 35 or more with an obesity associated comorbidity or a body mass index of 40. These are the most effective weight loss interventions and they are cost effective if the body mass index is 40 or more. These surgical procedures can induce remissions of type 2 diabetes for 10 years with significant reductions in hemoglobin A1c, blood pressure, and DL cholesterol. And they are associated in observational studies with reductions of all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, heart failure, MI, and stroke. But the problem is that these are, of course, surgical procedures. They can be done open or laparoscopic. They are associated with the surgical complications, with gastrointestinal side effects, with nutritional deficiencies, and sometimes with depression. So we have gone through a roadmap, the current approaches that we have to treat obesity, starting from lifestyle intervention, pharmacological treatments, and surgical intervention. So please tell me in your comments, what do you recommend to your patients? When do you go for drug therapy? What's your preferred drug? And how do you handle, and when do you recommend bariatric surgery for your patients? If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to hit the like button, share, and leave a comment. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss an update. Thanks for your support. See you all soon.